So if you'll turn over to Philippians chapter 1. Tonight's message is entitled, A Life Worthy of the Gospel. A Life Worthy of the Gospel. So we'll be in chapter 1. And although we're going to focus on uh, chapters 19 through 30, uh, we're going to start reading at verse 12, just so we can kind of add a little context to what we're saying. So Philippians 1, verse 12 says, And I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard to all that, that I rest in my imprisonment for Christ. And, the most, and most of the brothers have become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment and are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as I eagerly expect and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with my full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glorify Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your matter of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, not, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation that is from God. For it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you have saw and now hear that I still have. And brothers, this is the word of the Lord. God, we come to you one more time, Lord, humbly, but Lord, expectantly. Lord, we know that your word is filled with truth. God, that the power of your Spirit uses your word to conform us to the very image of Christ. Lord, I pray in these next few moments, God, that hearts would be soft and that seed would fall on good soil. And Lord, that you would use your word to transform our lives, God. Lord, that we would be hearers not only of the word to, to hear it, but also to be doers of the word. Lord, I thank you for every man, woman, and child sitting in this room today, Lord. Lord, let us become like you. Lord, let your spirit be with us. And Lord, let your spirit remake us and rebuild us as you uh, thrust us on towards the finish line. Lord, we, uh, we hold fast to you, Lord. And we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> the value and benefit of Christianity might be experienced to some degree in this life. I mean, there will be benefits of following Christ. There will be peace. Sometimes it will bring you blessing. Sometimes following Christ is going to change the pattern of your life in a way that, that actually will benefit you. For many of you, following Christ may be the first time in life where you've lived free from addiction or free from crime or in unity with your family Amen. or at peace. But the truth is that while that might be true, there will always be an element of persecution and there will always be an element of suffering for following Jesus. And here's the truth. Here's the bold truth that Philippians communicates to us. People who have 
realized and understood that we are living for a future reward will joyfully embrace suffering for the sake of Christ. There is no way to back away from this. There is nothing that sets true Christians apart from false converts more than suffering, more than persecution. And you may get tired of hearing that from this pulpit, but I'm not preaching off of a soapbox. I'm preaching line by line through books of the Bible. And that just seems to be a theme that occurs a lot in the New Testament, from the mouth of our Savior, from the mouth of the apostles. So the value and benefit of Christianity may be experienced some in this life, but there's no guarantee of that. The promise of Christianity isn't that you'll have everything that you want in this life, but that you will gain fellowship with Christ and through Him have eternal life. If you are not convinced of this, you will spend your life chasing the world and the things in the world. But if you truly come to a saving knowledge of Christ, you will be willing to sacrifice here, and you'll be able to sacrifice things in the here and now for the sake of future glory, future hope. I'm not saying there's no hope in this life. I'm not saying your life ain't going to be transformed. But the benefit of your reward will be fully realized in the life to come. So there may be seasons of prosperity and blessing. There may be seasons of suffering and trial. But the truth is, is you should remain the same in both seasons. Because you are living and looking to a future city whose builder and maker is God himself. I always like to give little analogies. Sometimes they come out good, sometimes they don't. But imagine this. Imagine if I came to you and said, listen, I want you to go to a supermax prison for five years and do a five-year sentence, the hardest place, the hardest time you can do. But I'll sign a contract before you go that when you get out, I'm going to give you a billion dollars. All you've got to do is go do this time. And even though this isn't possible, I'll actually give you back the time to your life that you missed out on. So you're going to suffer for five years, but I'm going to give you a billion dollars, and you're not even going to lose the five years in the long run. You'll get it back. Somehow I can put it at the end of your life or something. What would you do? You would go do the time. You're not losing any time, and you're gaining something great. Listen, a billion dollars is a, is a drop in the ocean compared to the glory that awaits us in Christ. I only use money because it's something worldly people and people in this life can identify with. Listen, future reward that is never ending, a life with no tears, no pain, no struggle, no sin, fully in Christ. The only reason this doesn't sound exciting to people is because we don't see Christ as a reward. And listen, the goal of most of my preaching is to get you to see Jesus for who he is. The great reward. The sun that outshines everything around him. So how did the apostle's life turn out? Well, James the son of Zebedee was the first apostle martyred in the year 46 AD. He was beheaded. The apostle Peter was crucified, but not wanting to be crucified in the same manner as his Savior, he asked that they would crucify him upside down because he didn't want to hang the same way Jesus did because he didn't feel like he deserved to. Andrew was tied to an X-shaped cross and hung upside down as he asphyxiated over the course of days. History says that he preached the gospel for several days while he was dying. Andrew, of course, Philip was hung in Heropolis, Turkey just north of, of Laodicea and just a little farther north of Colossae. Me and Wesley have stood there before in all three of those places. Matthew was killed in Ethiopia. Nathaniel was filleted by the knife in India. Thomas was ran through with the spear in Mandras, India. Thaddeus died in Persia, shot to death by arrows. James, the son of Alphaeus, was crucified in Lower Egypt and then sawed into pieces. Simon the Zealot was crucified. John the Revelator, 
the apostle whom Jesus loved, was boiled in oil, beaten, tortured, and then when he didn't die, was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, where he gave the, the, received the revelation, the Apocalypto, which is the final testimony of Christ in his second coming. John was the only person to actually die of old age. Once he was released from exile, he went and spent his last years in Ephesus. Which leads us to Paul. The Pharisee who persecuted the church, who was radically converted by Jesus on the road to Damascus. There's no way to overstate the fact that Paul didn't have anything to lose or had plenty to lose in this life. Paul himself was a Pharisee who had nobility, who had status, who had dual citizenship. In the first century, that meant something. He was a Jew in good standing. He also had Roman citizen, which meant he had rights. This man who was radically converted to the call of Christ abandoned all of this for the treasure that is Jesus. Paul was beat. Paul was whipped. Paul was tortured. And eventually he was beheaded for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here in this letter, we find him writing from a Roman prison to check on a church that he deeply cares about in Philippi. So Paul has been beaten and threatened to stop proclaiming the message of the gospel to the Gentile world, which was under Roman rule, which he refused to do. Last time we were in the book of Philippians, I guess two weeks ago, we talked about this, kind of gave the contextual backdrop for the story. Now there's going to be a lot more practical application. So what does it say in verse 12? Just as a reminder, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So that it has become throughout the whole imperial guard and to the rest that I am in prison for Christ. Uh, he didn't want to go to prison. It's like he was looking for trouble. But he preached the gospel and they put him in prison. And he was excited because there was a new mission field behind the walls of prison. I'm going to keep saying this, but the truth is, is because he saw Christ as a treasure that he wanted to give to everybody he saw. And he was willing to do anything. Let me tell you something about Paul. When he got beheaded in Rome, the reason he was there is because he kept pushing back. He could have got out of prison at one point. They were going to tell him to just agree with what we say. We'll let you go. But he said, no, I want to take this up, up the ladder. Why? Why do you want to take it to a higher court? Because he wanted to get in front of of the head honcho. He wanted to proclaim the gospel to the highest ranking person he could. He wanted to see the glory of God fall on the Gentile world and at the expense of his life. You think the words to live as Christ and to die as gain is some just words he said? No, it's not empty words. He died for the gospel. And these words should be a, an indictment towards us. When we live lukewarm, half-cocked lives for God. Listen, either Jesus is everything or he's nothing. Either he's the Messiah or we can just ignore him and go do our lives. Paul says, listen, I want you to know. I'm, he's writing to a church to encourage them, by the way. Listen, don't worry about me. The reason I'm here right now is to advance the gospel. And everyone knows why I'm here. That's why I'm excited. Could you imagine being in prison? And writing a letter to your mom, hey, he's so good. I got to this other part in the prison. They put me in solitary. I'm getting to minister to a new set of guards. I'm not telling you to muster up the courage to do this. I'm telling you to devote your life to seeing Christ and you will become this. Yeah. Christ will transform you. I'm not trying to tell you to try harder to do better. I'm telling you to fix your gaze on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. The implications of the gospel isn't just telling lost people Jesus loves them. There's a lot of times in our culture today where people say, Hey, listen, you shouldn't have violated the mandate in Canada. That preacher went to jail. He should have just closed the church down. Hey, we shouldn't talk about social issues that upset people. Let's not make people feel bad about immorality and abortion and greed and all the other junk that goes on in our culture. Let's just tell them Jesus loves them. Listen, these people didn't get killed just because they said, Jesus loves you. They were calling out their sin. 
They were saying that you are a godless culture and God will judge you. That is what Paul said on Mars Hill. That's what Paul said to the, to the Romans in the letter to the Roman church in chapter 1. He is talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that has implications into the full counsel of God. Listen, the gospel is the entryway, but it's about the entire word of God. It's about a holy God who will judge the world. It's about every line of the Ten Commandments. It's about every gospel, every uh, epistle, uh, every book of history, every jot and tittle, Jesus would say. The implications of the gospel aren't just telling G people that Jesus loves them. It's preaching the full counsel of God. And Paul is happy where he is because the believers in this area, listen, the believers who see that he's willing to put his money where his mouth is, those people have been emboldened to preach the gospel too. What does it say? It says, listen, they don't live in fear now. Now they're, now they're more bold to preach the word. John the Baptist was beheaded. Why? Because he was preaching about Jesus? No, because he looked Herod in the face and said, you are sexually immoral. Repent. And he is a martyr for the faith. He called out their sin. He called them to repentance. And this is an implication of the gospel. Rebuking a society by telling them that God will ju judge them for murdering babies on the altar of convenience is an implication of the gospel in preaching the full counsel of God. Today is, what, June 2nd? We've entered into a, a, a month where everyone in this wicked, corrupt culture is making everything rainbow, but not to remind us that God is, is not going to destroy the world again through His wrath by flooding the world. It's telling everyone to be prideful and happy and celebrate sexual immorality. And standing up flat footed and saying, this is sin, is implications of the gospel and preaching the full counsel of God. Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction. Can you imagine waving a flag that is looking at God with a word pride on it as you boast about your sin? God's saying, listen, be prideful about your sin, but one day you will be destroyed by it. And this is an implication of the gospel. Peter is preaching, or excuse me, Paul is preaching the gospel in the full counsel of God and is in prison. And here's the best part, brothers. He's joyful to be able to have the opportunity to spread the gospel. And don't get me wrong. Paul isn't joyful, uh, you know, looking for chances to get beat. He's not looking for chances to suffer. He's not just throwing, you know, going and breaking the law so he can go to jail. Paul is enjoyed that he gets to be counted worthy to suffer for something that matters. Verse 19, For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that this will turn out for my deliverance, as is my eager expectation and hope, that I will not at all be ashamed. But that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. So he hopes for deliverance, but not at any cost. Not deliverance at any cost. Not by recanting. Not by stepping back from what he's proclaiming. See, this is the motivation of his life. You'll hear this a lot from here, but I'm here to tell you that this isn't extreme Christianity. This is genuine Christianity. He's doing this not because it's easy. Don't ever think that these people who are suffering in, in, in the Bible are doing it because they have some sort of supernatural thing where pain doesn't hurt or where there, there is no suffering or there is no trial, there is no depression in the dark. It's not easy, but to them it's worth it because they've counted the cost and they see Christ as their reward. They do this because they're fully convinced. Paul was fully convinced that it was worthwhile. Either he's doing this because he's fully convinced or he is insane. Either he really believes that he will stand before God in eternity and reap the benefit of a life poured out for God 
or he's a crazy person. Christ is worth it. Paul knows his future in Christ is worth it. He wants Christ to be honored with his body while alive or while dead. Now we, we can focus on the dead part, the martyristic part, but what about the alive part? It's not just about being willing to die for Christ. It's about being willing to live well for Christ, to suffer for Christ, to rejoice for Christ, to abound in the blessing, to act the same way when you're suffering. When things don't go your way. And once again, I'm not telling you to do this to impress God. I'm telling you, you will do this if you truly see God. Verse 21. What does he say? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. Paul's not saying he's thinking about killing himself. He's just saying, listen, there's benefits to both things. I can stay here and suffer and be a benefit to you and to the church. But part of me just wants to be with Christ. That's why he's willing to live this sort of radical life. That's why he's willing to have his head separated from his shoulders eventually. Because he believes that God is, is really displayed in the person of Christ. And he believes he's worth dying for. <laughs> the sole purpose of his life was to bring glory to God. Why? Because he was persuaded that Jesus was the Christ. Because he was convinced that he would live with him forever in glory. It's because he believed the word of Christ. This world doesn't have anything to offer us. See, most of our problems, the, the reason we chase the things in this world... We try so hard to break free from them is because we don't see the value of Jesus Christ. And here's why most of us don't. It's because we have grown up around some sort of truncated, false, Sunday school, youth group, pizza, sort of like, it's just sort of like some exterior thing we do kind of Christianity. It's like a myth we've been brought up with. So we view it that way. We believe in Jesus. We believe in Santa Claus. We believe in the Tooth Fairy. And one day we outgrow these things. Maybe we pay some homage to them, right? We still pay homage to Santa when our nephew and niece is around, right? We still pay homage to, we still pay homage to uh, uh, the Tooth Fairy. We'll pay homage to Jesus on Christmas and Easter. If he came out of the ground, he is Lord. But still we're, we're, we're caught up, we're drawn up, we're, we're persuaded, we're, we're drawn away by the things of this world. Why? Because we love them. We love them. We love sin. We love self-pleasure. We love lifting ourselves high. We love being the center of attention. It's our natural posture. The world doesn't have anything to offer us. But listen, just like Satan tempted Jesus with the world, he tempts us with it as well. You remember the temptation of Jesus when he took Jesus up to a high place and said, listen, if you'll just bow before me, you can have all this. What did Jesus say? You should have no other God. No other God. And if we see God the same way Jesus did, if we see Christ as God, this world won't have any sway on us. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you'll never be tempted to sin. I'm not saying you're going to have to wage war against the members of your body. But once you're regenerate, and here's the thing, brothers. Here's the problem with Christian decisionalism. As many of you are convinced that you're following Jesus because you said some bunk prayer when you were 10 years old and you thought it covered you. You ever heard a preacher talk about fire insurance? There is no such thing. Good trees bear good fruit. People who have decided, listen, people who have been reborn in Christ have a new nature. They desire to live a new life. And when they sin, it's the sin they hate. Not the sin they love. Christian sin, non-Christian sin. The difference is, is the sin you used to love as a, as a non-believer, you hate as a Christian. I don't mean you won't ever fall into it. You'll fall into it. 
But the difference is, is you'll wage war against it. You'll fight it. 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world. I won't even go there for a second. You ever seen Scarface? He's <laughs> got the, the, glo- the picture of the world, that big globe in front of his house. He wants it all. Maybe that's, that's not your life. But there's a reason why we look at movies like that and we get excited. It's because we love the world. We want to be in control. We want to be the man. We want to call the shots of our own life. We want power. We want people to respect us. We want to be able to do what we want to do. But Jesus says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, listen to me. The love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of the life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. But whoever does, says a prayer when they're ten. No, whoever does the will of the Father abides forever. Some of you guys might get mad because I I kick around the salvation mantra all the time. Saying a prayer you don't mean to a God you ain't interested in following isn't going to save you. Jesus never said, repeat after me. He said, listen, sell all you have, give to the poor, and follow me. The reason why we've changed that or we've altered is because we want a salvation that can let us live our lives and still have Jesus. We've built churches like that. We've surrounded ourselves with preachers who will tell us that. But the Apostle John, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is saying, No way! If you love the world, love for the Father is not in you. Examine yourself to see if you're truly in the faith. We are tempted with the treasures of this world and the love of this world because they're valuable to us. But Jesus himself says in Matthew 6, 19, Don't store up for yourself treasure in the earth where moth and vermin destroy where thieves break in and steal. But listen, store up for yourself treasure in heaven, where moth and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Where is your treasure? You say Jesus. Maybe some outsider could take a little independent accounting of your life. And see if there's enough evidence to uh, convict you of that. Is that what your checkbook says? Is that what your time says? Is that the way you spend your your R&R time says? How about your life? What have you done with your life? I had to ask myself that question. Just because I work here, I still have to ask myself that question. What is your treasure, Josh? What are you living your life for? Why did the treasures, trappings, and temptations of this world have no sway on Paul? Because he found a treasure that outshined all of them. He found a pearl of great price. He found a treasure that was buried in a field that was worth bankrupting himself to get. The bright and morning star, Jesus, King of the world, the Savior of the world, who's calling us to pick up our cross and follow him. We talked about this a few weeks ago when we were in the parables of Jesus. But Jesus is calling you to acknowledge and surrender to the cross that he died on. Because that is the way your sins are forgiven. But those who believe in Jesus will also pick up their own cross. Give up their life. Not for the forgiveness of their sins. Not to earn God's love. But because you are a follower of Jesus. Because you have been grafted into the vine. Because you have a new nature. One of the main reasons people criticize Christianity is because of the problem of evil in the world. You ever hear that? You ever say that? How about the problem of suffering in the world? See, most mainstream American Christianity that teaches wellness and a pep talk gospel the blessing, health, and wealth gospel, a Christianity that doesn't address suffering, that doesn't address evil. You want to know why 
there's evil in the world is because God is patient. Because if God eradicated all the evil in the world, you wouldn't be sitting here. And neither would I. See, we like to look at the sins of other people. Man, why is there why are these, these dictators and these horrible people? Why are there sex predators and all these horrible people? We look at them and say, God should do something about this. The problem is, is you don't realize that you are a sinner, as evil and wicked as them, and you desperately need salvation. The problem of evil is because God is patient and kind. Don't be alarmed. One day he will eradicate evil for good. But for now, he came to seek and save lost, repentant sinners to extend mercy to them. So the problem of evil is no problem. The problem of evil isn't a problem. We are the reason that there's the problem of evil. And it's God's love and grace that keeps him from, from just ending it. Because he loves, what does it say? So He wishes that no one would perish. That everyone would have everlasting life. He's holding out his hand to us. Saying, follow me. A biblical uh, uh, a gospel can answer the problem of evil as well as the problem of suffering. The reason people doubt God in light of human suffering is because they've been deceived into a brand of Christianity that preaches your best life now. All the people who are leaving the faith now, all the people from Hillsong and and the guy from DC Talk that just renounced his faith and all these other people, they always say the same thing. Christianity didn't deal with real life. It's because they didn't go to a real church where the real gospel was preached. There's plenty of churches that tell you if you do X, Y, Z, God will give you the desires of your heart. You'll be rich. You'll be blessed. You'll never be sick. And when that doesn't happen, there's only one of two options. What happens? Either God messed up somehow, or more likely, I messed up somehow. Surely I'm sick. I mean, is it either God's not real or I didn't have enough faith? Don't you realize that that brand of Christianity is the most legalistic kind of Christianity there is. A Christianity that's based around works, that's dependent on you. The true gospel is Christ secured salvation for us. And people who have really come to terms with that will live radically different lives. Radically. We see examples of it in the Bible. The problem is, is we pretend like these are heroes of the faith. We could never be a Peter. We could never be a Paul. We could never be a a John. What were these people? That's why Jesus picked average people and transformed them. He took roughneck fishermen. He took outcast tax collectors. He took Samaritan women that had been married five times. He took legalistic Pharisees. He showed that he could transform anyone who had a humble, repentant heart. But I'm here to tell you, if you've been transformed, your life will change. If you come out the other side of this place and your life is the same as it was before you came in here, if you've got plans that you had the day you walked in here and you've never even cha- even thought about other plans, you ain't ever got on your bunk and said, God, I'm yours. You've changed my life. I don't got any plans. Send me. Take my life. I'm for you. I'm not saying you're, you're going to go out of here and be a missionary. You may go out of here and sell insurance. Or weld on a pipeline. But you're going to do it because you laid everything on the altar and God directed your path. Or maybe a trucking company, right? For For the glory of God, though. Listen, your ways are not His ways. Here's the truth about laying everything on the altar I want you to understand. We talk about laying everything down. We give Christ everything. Everything. Our kids, our wife, our future, our hope, our sin, our baggage, good and bad, we give it to Him. And then His grace, He gives us back the things we need in light of Him. You weren't a very good husband before, but now that you have Christ, maybe here's your family back. Except this time, maybe you'll steward it in a different way. Hey, maybe here is a career that you wanted, but this time you'll be able to sustain it because you're not doing it for your glory, you're doing it for His. 
But if your mind is, I'm going there and God's going to bless me, you don't see God. You don't know God. Because if you saw Him, you would want to give everything up for Him. When you walked past your tax collector's booth and said, listen, follow me, you would say, okay, listen, the, the radical call to follow Jesus is not some mature place in Christianity. It's the entryway into Christianity. It's the beginning of Christianity. Follow me is the beginning of Christianity. There's some of you who ain't ever followed Jesus. You've been to church your whole life. You said prayers and sung Hillsong and wept and done all sorts of stuff. But when the rubber met the road, you were never willing to lay an iota of a thing down. And that shows that you don't really know who Jesus is. If you truly see God in the person of Christ and His gospel, you will see Him as everything. And you'll see the value of following Jesus. See, when I talk about this sort of radical discipleship and Jesus being the treasure, those who really know Christ, they're overjoyed. Because they know I'm talking about something valuable. When Jesus in chapter 6 of Matthew says what? Don't store up treasures on earth. Those things are going to burn up. They're going to disappear. They're going to fade away. But store up treasures in heaven. Listen, like the rich young ruler you don't think it's very valuable because you don't see Jesus as a treasure. You don't really have too many thoughts about heaven or the life to come. The true Christian is convinced of the life to come. The true Christian is willing to do anything in this life to obtain the next life. Any person who says, listen, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good has no idea who God is. Because unless you are heavenly minded, you can't be any earthly good to anyone. And that includes your wife and your kids and yourself. If you don't see who Jesus is, you ain't going to have the power to be the man you need to be in this life. Let me say one other thing. You think you can manipulate your way back into the will of God. God has never honored manipulation one time. Your little, your little plan, I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to get one over on my parents so I can do this or that. And then it's all. Then I'm going to follow God. I'm going to get my way and then I'm going to follow God. Listen, you've already turned and walked the other direction. The reason I'm saying all this is because we're looking at a man who is sitting in a prison and his mind is completely fixated on God and others. If you truly see Christ in His gospel as everything, you will see the outcome of following Christ and living for Christ as a reward no matter how it pans out in this life. You'll even see it worth persecution. You'll either even see it as worth something suffering for. So let's talk a little bit about Christian suffering and the joy that we should find in it as Christians. Don't worry, i got some scriptures. Philippians 1.20 it says, as it is my eager expectation, eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but it will be with full courage, now as is always, that Christ will be honored in my body, whether I'm alive or dead. Wow, that's a life surrendered to Christ. How about this? Many people like to say, hey, I have a good relationship with God. Most of the people who say this are self-deceived. Want to know how you know the difference between what love is and what's not really love? Sacrifice. You're willing to, you're willing to sacrifice for something you love. It's easy to say we love God, but are we willing to suffer for Him? Stand for Him? If we're unwilling to do this for our spouse or our kids, people would look at us and say, what a coward. Some dude just walks up and starts nailing on your son. Oh, I don't want to get in any trouble. He's a big dude. <laughs> you think people are going to think you're noble? That dude just beat your son up right in front of you. I don't care how big he is. I'm going to die for his knees. I'm going to start elbowing him in the face. I'm going to save my son. You ain't going to come over and you ain't going to treat my wife that way. So why, why, why is it some weird thing to think that it would be that we shouldn't be suffer or persecuted for the sake of Christ. He was willing to do it for us. It's easy to say we love God, but if we're not willing to suffer for Him, stand for Him, then we are liars. Acts 5.41 says, Then they left the presence of the council. We're talking about John and Peter. 
rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. What, were they, what just happened to them? They were whipped within a few moments of death and said, don't ever preach the gospel around the synagogue again. What does the Scripture say they did? The very next day, preaching the gospel. Hebrews 11.24 says, By faith Moses, when he was grown up, listen, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered reproach for Christ of greater wealth than all the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking forward to the reward. What's the reward? What was Moses looking forward to? He was looking forward to Christ. Paul understood life through the lens of eternity and that the reward that awaited him upon death was worth more than anything in this life. It doesn't mean Paul had a death wish. It doesn't mean Paul was, was you know, trying to kill himself or fatalistic. He just knew that there was it, they couldn't take anything from him. They couldn't do anything to him because he understood that to live was for the sake of Christ and that to die would be gain. Second Timothy 2.12 If we endure, we will reign with Him. Woo! But if we deny Him, He will deny us. Second Timothy 3.12 Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. You might say, well, wait a minute. I've never been persecuted for the gospel I preach or the life I live. Really? You live your life fully devoted to this and everybody in your life knows where you stand on all these issues? You're willing to tell your Jehovah's Witness cousin that Jesus is the only way to God? You're willing to look at someone who's an atheist and says you're a judgmental bigot and say, listen, I love you, brother, but apart from Christ you will die and inherit eternal destruction? There's only one way to God? The only mercy in life is in the gospel? Grace is, is found in the, the bloodshed of Jesus Christ on the cross. There is no indifference in the Christian life. There's a line in the sand where Jesus says, You're for me or you're against me. Deny me in front of men and I'll deny you in front of my Father. Listen, this ain't no joke. We're talking about eternity. Most would say here, I won't deny Him. But our words and supposed convictions are proven true or false by our actions. Our actions. If we say we love Christ and we're living for Him, but choose to reject something His Word says because we don't like it or the culture don't like it or because it's not easy, we reject Christ as self. If you reject the Word, you reject Christ. We just studied this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things that were made were made through Him. In Him was light, and that light was the life of mankind. And the light shines in the darkness, and brothers, the darkness cannot overcome it. The Word of God, every word is inspired. If you don't believe the Bible is inerrant, you're not a Christian. If you're not willing to stand for Jesus, you better examine yourself. You better do it here and now. Some of you think I'm a fool standing up here, and that is fine because I take joy in being persecuted for Christ. Not because I'm trying to offend you, but because I'm convinced. I'm convinced. I know what people say. Oh, they only work at Teen Challenge because they couldn't get a real job. They only stay there because they're weak. How about people who say, listen, it's their crutch. Think I got a crutch? I'm in a gurney. Jesus is carrying me. I need more than a crutch. I needed a heart transplant. I needed a new life. Now listen, doing the will of the Father doesn't mean you're sinless. This is, this is something you have to examine for yourself. Yes, people can look at your fruit and probably say, but the truth is, I don't know. There ain't no way I can know if you're in a, a season of sin or, or if you never were, belonged to Christ. That's why the Bible is constantly talking about examining in ourselves. We examine ourselves to the law of God to see that we need Christ. And then as Christians, we examine our, ourselves in light of Christ. Don't tell me that you love God if you're not willing to deny yourself. 
Jesus never said what's right would be easy or feel good. But in light of eternity, brothers, it is worth it. If you're truly a Christian, you will be willing to suffer for Christ. Your greatest desire should be to obey Christ. That's what faith is. If, if you got everything in the here and now, it wouldn't take any faith. Our belief is that what God has promised for us, we'll see in part here, but we'll fully realize in the future. The reward. And brothers, it will be worth anything you gave up in this life. Once your eyes are open to that, you will bear the fruit of joy in blessing and even in suffering. Getting pretty close to the end. To live as Christ. To live as Christ. What does that mean? To live is Christ and to live as Christ. John in 1 John says, listen, we should do the will of God and live as Jesus did. Do you want to know a good example? Live like Jesus did. What did Jesus do? Jesus lived according to the will of his Father. Jesus lived according to the Word. Jesus lived his life proclaiming the gospel to others. And ultimately, Jesus gave up his life as a ransom for many. What are we doing with our lives? To live as Christ. I can stand up here and pound the pulpit and talk about being willing to die for Christ. But the most important thing is, are you willing to live for him? Do you see him worthy as living for him? To die is gain. That's not something threatening. It's actually exciting. I'm more convinced every single day that when I close my eyes, I will be absent from my body and present with the Lord, as Paul says in Thessalonians. I believe that Jesus Christ, through faith in Him, that my sins won't be counted against me. I believe that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Not because I'm a good person, but because I've been saved by grace. But there is an evidence of that in my life, I hope. I hope that someone could look at me and very quickly realize what I'm about. I hope someone could look at my social media page and within seconds find out that I'm not just a, a sort of Christian, that I'm one of those like extreme, whack job, fully sold out, sort of radicalized Christians. I want them to know. I don't want to be the guy that has the fish sticker on my bumper sticker as I'm flipping people off because they stole my, my parking spot. I don't want to be the person that makes ungodly business deals and deals with unwise scales as people say, well, that's, just, that's how everybody does it. I want people to look at my life and see Christ. Just like Paul. I want, I want in, in life and in death, I want people to know what I was about. It doesn't mean we're fatalistic. It doesn't mean we're suicidal. And here's why. Because our life doesn't belong to us. You don't have a right to do anything with your life. You are a piece of clay fashioned by the potter. You don't get to tell him anything. You don't get to set yourself up as judge over him. You don't get to say, I don't deserve this. This isn't fair. This is what I want. Your life is to be used for his will and his glory and to forward his gospel. If we truly love God, we'll obey his commandments. Jesus died for us. That's his love to us. You know what our love to him is? Obedience. Not legalistic obedience. That means that if you mess up, you're not Christ. We obey because we belong to Christ. Because we love Christ. Because we've been transformed into the image of Christ and are being transformed into the image of Christ. What does it say in John 14, 21? Whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. Please hear these words. I'm not saying you have to be perfect. But if your desire in this life isn't to please Christ, if the, the desire of your heart, if you're not mourning when you sin, if you still can just live in open, unrepentant sin for weeks and months, you should be worried. The check engine light on your car is blinking. It's telling you something. Suffering and obedience doesn't earn you anything. It just proves that you're genuine. We have a great example in this, Christ himself. John 15, 13, greater love has no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. Romans 5, 8 said, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. 
While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Of course, John 3:16 through 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God didn't send his son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Paul Washer says it this way. God's not begging you to accept him in his heart. He's got one hand holding off his wrath and he has another hand holding out to you. He's holding his wrath off and holding a hand to you. And one day both hands will drop. I'm not trying to scare you into being a Christian. I'm saying today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to examine yourself to see if you're truly in the faith. I examine myself every day as part of my prayer life. God expose the wicked intents of my heart. God forgive me for the place that I fell short. God help me glorify you in my life. God, help me lay down this besetting sin that still has a little bit of a jab in me. People who would say God would never ask us to suffer because He loves us are very deluded. When you think about that fact, you think about people who say God would never ask us to suffer. All the health, wealth, and and prosperity people say God would never ask you to suffer. He sent His Son to suffer. His perfect Son. The Bible says clearly, listen, those who participate in my sufferings will also participate in my resurrection. You've got to have a cross to have a resurrection. You've got to lay down an old life to raise up a new life. So here's the closing. What were you worth to God? You know the answer. Jesus. So his thoughts towards you aren't in in question. His intentions towards you aren't on trial. God owed you judgment. We're all getting what we deserve. We're all reaping what we've sown. We're all heading to hell. But instead of giving us what we deserve, God sent His Son, His perfect, flawless, eternal, pure Son to die for wretched sinners like us. So the question is, what, what did God think of you? Or what were you worth to God? The question is, what does God worth to you? Well, I'll frame it a different way. Do you actually see his worth? The reason why we can blaspheme the name of Christ with our lives is we don't see the value of the sacrifice Jesus is. I've said this here before, but for some of you new guys, I want you to, to hear me when I say this. If you think hell is unfair... For someone denying Christ, it's because you don't see how valuable Christ is. You don't see how valuable his life was. You don't see how valuable the sacrifice God in the flesh is. Back to the text, verse 27. Paul says, listen, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come to you and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they'll be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now still see I have. You know, it's a gift to be able to believe in Christ. It's a, it's a gift to feel conviction for your sins. It's a gift for your blind eyes to be open to the truth of God. God has granted to those of us in Christ the ability to see Him. The ability to believe in Him in a way that changes our life. It's been granted to you to participate in His suffering, in His death, in His persecution, in His shame. And it's also been granted to you to receive heavenly treasure and inherit eternal life that will never be taken away. What did Paul say in verse 27? Whatever happens. That's a large statement. There's probably some of you sitting here today that said, if this didn't happen here, then I'd be able to do it. (laughs) If this one thing would work out. He says, whatever happens. 
He's talking to people who are convinced, who see Christ, who are unfrightened, who are unashamed, who will stand up like a babbling, spitting idiot and tell you that Jesus is the only way to God. And everything in this book is true. And the parts that you don't understand, you better accept anyway. You don't, you don't have to have it all figured out to acknowledge that if God said it, it's true. You want to know how something's good? Because God said it is. Any of you who sit here and say, well, it didn't seem very good that God would judge this group of people or that God would do this. You better be careful. You better read the book of Ezekiel. You better read the book of Isaiah. Setting yourself as judge above the creator of the universe. You don't see God. Because if you saw him, you wouldn't only see the wrath stored up for humanity, but you would see the depth of his mercy and his love. You can't have one without the other. That's why I preach it every single week. You can't have the gospel of grace without sinful mankind and the wrath of God. If we say we're being saved, we've got to be saved from something, right? Whatever happens, if you belong to Christ, whatever happens, no matter what it is, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. Your wife leaves you and she don't come back. Conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. You go to prison for 10 years. Conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. Listen, I'm not here trying to convince you to be Christians by sweet talking you. I'm telling you there's a count, a cost to follow Jesus. But I'm also telling you it's worth it. In the end, it is worth it. I don't want to create false converts who come out of here saying a bunch of Jesus stuff. I want to create biblical disciples who will go out there and turn this world upside down for the glory of God. We got enough false converts walking around who can't even acknowledge Jesus in front of their people at their job. Or they're like, hey man, I want to judge you. Listen, I can't judge you. God's going to judge you. And I'm here to warn you, to beg you, to plead with you and say, listen, God's mercy is extended to you here and now. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel by which you're being saved. And listen, if you are being saved by it, then that will be a charge that you will accept. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ like you believe it. Like this life is but a vapor and Christ himself is worth everything. And that Christ himself is alone the reward you're living for. My wife's pregnant right now. I've been waiting for a son for my whole life. I'm excited about it. A lot of things are changing in my mind. But my commitment to Christ will not be wavered by a son. I love my wife. She didn't come before Christ. And I, and I hope I never come before Christ in her life either. He is the treasure. He is everything. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then Paul says, whether I come to hear about you or see you or hear about you in my absence, that you will stand firm, listen, in one spirit, striving together for one faith of the gospel. And then you won't be afraid. You won't be afraid of what people are going to say about you. You won't be afraid if people take your freedom away. You won't be afraid if people take your life away. You won't be afraid if they don't think you're uh, Johnny in the cut anymore. You lose your street credit. Come on, dude. Freaking grow up. You think you're cool because you're a freaking gangster, dude? Listen, this life is a vapor. It's a vapor. And I'm not just talking to those of us who played, you know, street thugs. I'm talking about the people that think they're going to rise to the top of Wall Street and rule the world. It's all garbage. It's all loss. According to the glory of Jesus Christ, He is the bright and shining star. He is the morning sun. He is our salvation. He is our peace. He is our hope. He is everything. We'll be done in five minutes. The fact that you are willing to be persecuted and suffer for the gospel and stand firm in one spirit and strive together for one faith, that faith being in the gospel of Jesus Christ, without being frightened of those that oppose you, will be a sign. You want to know what's going to be a sign to? It's going to be a sign to the people who are persecuting you that they are going to be destroyed. You're going to say it with joy. 
I don't want anybody to be destroyed. But I'm saying your life, the fact that you're willing to put your money where your mouth is, practically, in your home, at your job, the way you spend your money, the way you spend your life, the way you raise your kids, the things you're willing to do and the things you aren't willing to do, it's going to, it's going to condemn the people around you. Maybe it'll draw some of them to repentance. It'll be a sign to those who will be destroyed that you will be saved by God. The God who you stood for. The God you suffered for. The God you felt like it was an honor. It's an honor to give your life for God. It's an honor, like Paul says, to pour it out like a drink offering to him. What a pleasure it is to be able to participate in the suffering of Christ by faith. This testimony to some that they're being destroyed, but in other cases it will cause them to repent. And it also will embolden your brothers in Christ. Paul saying, listen, I'm glad that I'm in prison. I'm glad that I had a chance to show and that I belong to Christ and put my money where my mouth is. Because now it's emboldening other people to go preach the gospel. Yeah. I hope that some of you look at my life, maybe one or two of you, and say, man, it's the real deal. Not because I want some sort of praise. I just want my life to mean something in honor of God. I don't have any other accolades. I'm not trying to be a rock star. I'm not trying to be successful. I'm not trying to do anything else. I have one solitary purpose in life, and it is to draw you to God. It's all I want. So here's the final question. Is Christ your treasure? Think about it. Just examine your life. Think about your life up until this point. Think about what you spent most of your time thinking about this week. I'm not trying to condemn you. There's place, plenty of places in my life, no matter how much time I spend praying, no matter how much I study the Bible, where I realize there's still work to do. It's like working out. It's about staying in shape. It's about continually doing. Now, I'm not telling you to do this if you don't love Christ. That would be legalism. I'm not telling you to do something you hate. I'm hoping that those of you outside of Christ will be transformed by His power, His love, His grace, and His mercy. And I'm telling those of you who, who claim to follow Jesus, pick up your cross. Let's go. I want you to rise up and be leaders in this place. If you're brand new, I know this may be different than what you're used to hearing. I'm just glad you're here. But if you claim to follow Jesus, I want you to pick up. I want to, I want to see your cross. I'll show you mine. Is Christ your treasure? And here's all you really need to focus on. Like Paul. Christ was his treasure. If you don't see Christ as a treasure worth giving everything up in your life for, then you've got some work to do. You've got some praying to do. You've got some, you got some things to do. I'm not trying to, listen, please, I'm not telling you you're going to earn God's love by doing stuff. I'm asking you to look, take a look at Christ. I mean, how, I don't know how else to say it. I wish, there's people who have way better, like, eloquence than me. I wish I could just, like, the God of the universe came down and died for you. You deserved wrath. You deserve judgment. You deserve whatever you get. And someone who owed you nothing gave you everything. It's hard for us, though, because we've had people in our life do a lot for us, and we could care less. We need God to open our blind eyes, to open the eyes of our heart. Because if you truly see Christ as treasure, you'll answer the call to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. That's not extreme Christianity. That's not even mature Christianity. That is the beginning of Christianity. Jesus is your treasure. And if he's not, I pray that you would see him that way soon. Lord, I thank you for this day that you've made. God, I thank you for men in this place and women in this place, Lord, who, who are followers of you. Lord, I pray that you would empower them by your spirit, Lord, to overcome the temptations of the world. Lord, I pray that those of us who claim Christ, God, that we would unite in one spirit under one faith. It doesn't matter if, if I'm the pastor and there's students or interns. or It doesn't matter. The, the places in this place don't matter. 
What unifies us or separates us is our commitment to Christ, Lord. Lord, I pray that everyone here who is committed to Christ will unify, Lord, in the power of the Spirit, Lord, and stand for the faith, Lord. Lord, I pray that, that some of these men who are getting ready to leave, they'll stand for the faith in their home. God, that they'll be bold and stand for the, the faith in their workplace, God, that they will be gospel proclaimers wherever they go. Lord, I pray for the men under the sound of my voice today that may be confused or even upset by the, the tone of my message, God. I pray that your spirit would enlighten your word, Lord, not me, Lord. I pray that they would just look into the book of Philippians, God, and just see what the plain words of Scripture say. And Lord, that you would show them the truth. Lord, I also pray that any, any part of what I said doesn't line up with you, God, that it would just disappear from their mind quickly, Lord. But the parts that are, that are true to your word, God, they would be like arrows that find their mark, God. We love you and we thank you, Lord. I just thank you for your mercy in my life, God. Lord, I pray you have mercy on these men, Lord, that you have mercy on situations in their life. You would show yourself to them in, in very personal and real ways, God. Lord, we don't lay down our life for you for nothing, God, but we do it by faith and then we trust you to direct our path and to add things to us according to your wisdom and to bless us in, in the time that you see fit, in the season you know we're ready. And Lord, we put our trust and faith in you tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.